into it so it's perfect. And uh, I think that you guys are on the, the cutting edge. What I figured I'd do is because I've talked to a few of you and a few of your professors, and it's the same thing, is that it's, you know, it's kind of new, so I'll do a really quick history, maybe five minutes, of just the securities laws and kind of how it's changing. And then we'll, I'll introduce the panel, or I'll let you guys introduce yourself. And then we'll, uh, you know, you'll do a little brief presentation if you'd like. And then we can dig into case studies of, you know, DC has really become a hub for crowdfunding for small balance commercial real estate and larger balance commercial real estate as well in single family. So uh, let's dig into it really fast. Um, I did this last night, but I don't think you need to know much about me. I put on workshops all over the place. But let's get into it really fast. Um, Crowdfunding's not new. I mean, it's been around forever. This is the example that everybody uses. The base of the Statue of Liberty was crowdfunded. Uh, they sent it over here. Nobody knew what to do with it. Uh, so Pulitzer raised hundred thousand dollars a dollar at a time. So uh, there's different types. There's donation, rewards base, uh, and equity model. The donation and reward you probably heard about with Kickstarter and uh, Indiegogo. This is not what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about equity crowdfunding. This is an example of rewards. Who's heard of Oculus Rift? Oculus Rift, right? They, it was donation based. They're 3D immersion goggles. They raised two million dollars. Next year, uh, Facebook bought them out for 2.5 billion. That's a thousand percent return on an investment in a, in a year. The problem was this was donation and not investment, right? So if you would have put in hundred dollars and this was equity, you'd add a ten thousand dollar check a year later. I think I know we will get these in equity. We'll talk about it a little bit later. There's peer to peer lending. Over a billion dollars is written pursuant to this 424B. This is Prosper and Lending Club. We're not really going to talk about that too much. That's, uh, you know, we're, uh, theoretically you loan money to another peer, but they, Prosper and Lending Club came in and they had to kind of rework the laws so that uh, we won't get into it. Kiva.org is another example, uh, really kind of one of the first uh, that kind of pushed the laws moving forward to, to get the securities rewritten. So Kiva.org does microfinance to foreign uh, it's, I'm sorry, it's, over, it's only overseas. Uh, they have $550 million of U.S. investors who do these micro loans, but because it's illegal for U.S. investors to do it, all that money has to stay overseas and it can't be invested over here. Uh, anyway, so kind of pushed uh, for the laws to move forward. Kiva.org, by the way, the biggest, uh, um, the biggest objection to crowdfunding is everybody says that there's uh, fraud is going to proliferate, right? It's, you know, nobody's going to be able to control it. Not true, they're, they're, I don't know if we'll get too deep into it, but they've really thought carefully about how to protect it. But Key.org is a great example that 98.9% uh, .9 repayment rate, uh, they do 500, about $500 loans uh, to people who make about 4 or $5 a day, 98% repayment rate. U.S. is really be behind on crowdfunding, um, you know, in a, in a, a stable um, economy like ours with transparent markets and rule of law. You know, fintech really doesn't take off as much as it does in other countries where corruption seems to be the norm. So the U.S. is kind of lagging behind, but in the international markets, I'd say Australia is probably the most advanced with the most history. Zero percent fraud right now uh, reported as, I mean, it's probably two years old, but still. Now we're going to talk about securities uh, crowdfunding really fast. So when we talk about securities-based crowdfunding, we're really talking about the JOBS Act. So the JOBS Act passed in April 5th of 2012, and it was the first major rewrite of the securities laws in over 80 years, right, since the Great Depression, basically. And we'll get, I won't get too deep into it, but I'll, I'll run through it really fast. Really fast, who's it for? 99.7% of U.S. employer firms, they employ 28 million, there are 28 million businesses versus just 18,500 firms. Uh, with more than 500 employees. This is really for the small, um, the small companies uh, so that they can raise equity and move forward. Uh, I'll talk here in a second. Uh, the specifics of the Jobs Act, there are six different titles. I, might go too fa I, I know I'm going too fast, but I want to fit everybody in in a short time frame. This is usually like an eight-hour course that I do on this, so if, uh, we've got uh, an esteemed panel here to be, be able to deep dive into any questions that you have. Anyways, so the Jobs Act is broken up into seven different um, Titles, uh, the ones you really need to uh, concern yourself with are Title II, Title III, and Title IV. I'll talk about them really fast here. Um, so the Jobs Act passed in uh, April 5th of 2012. The provisions in the law stated the timelines that they had to. So once a law passes, it goes to the regulators to write the rules and regulations of how it's going to be enforced and how it's going to work and everything. So in the Jobs Act, I think they said, what, 90 days to do these rules and regulations? 
Title III still is not legal. The chairman of the SEC, she said, uh, in the law it said you have 90 days to get these rules and regulations out so that we can start using this in 2012. She basically said that I, I didn't write the laws on the, or the rules and regulations for Title III because I don't want it associated with my legacy. So there's a, there's a big thing in, uh, you know, those who have the most to lose or the most entrenched, right, fight the greatest. So I don't know what they have to lose, but there's a lot of regulators that are really fighting crowdfunding to protect the little guy. Did you see the Shark Tank where Mark Cuban got all mad at that guy when he even mentioned crowdfunding? That was a shock to me. I don't know if you guys know what I'm talking about. We'll move on really fast. All right, Title II. Title II is 506C exemption. Um, so whenever you're going to raise money, uh, you're going to, you have to abide by the securities laws, right? You have to go public, get a broker, dealer, or you have to use a known exemption. 504, 505, and 506 is probably the most common, right? But with these offerings, uh, you can't generally solicit. They have to be known to you. And uh, this is our private placement. It costs us about $35,000. But I couldn't advertise this. I would have to have a prior relationship and give it to you, right? Title II lifts the ban on solicitation so that you can use modern, you can use modern uh, e-marketing to solicit investors, right? This one, the way the 505s, the 504s, the 506, I'd have to qualify you as an accredited investor before I can show it to you with the few unaccredited who can join independent on the exemption. But I'd have to qualify before I can show it to you. Now, I can show it to you and then qualify you before you invest, which really kind of makes sense. You guys get, you got, is this a little bit too much? All right, moving on. So Title II is the only one that's legal right now, by the way. Well, that's not true. Title II is the first one that became legal a year and a half ago. There's roughly, what, a billion dollars raised through Title II, I think, somewhere around there. They expect in real estate in 2015, roughly 2.5 billion will be raised through this. But it's what most of the portals, I would say, most of the portals are using the Title II exemption to raise money. We'll dig into it a little bit deeper if you have any questions. Title III is the real crowdfunding. Uh, you can see the regular, it's 486 exemption. So this would allow un un unaccredited investors to invest in your offering other than a, like a public offering. So does everyone know what an accredited and unaccredited investor is? Right, accredited uh, million dollar net worth not including your primary residence or $200,000 a year in income or 300000 fine, right? When you were doing these alternative investments like in the Title II that we just showed, only accredited investors are allowed to invest in Title II. So the Title III would allow unaccredited investors with limitations, right? Uh, the company can only raise a million a year. You know, uh, I think it's what, a cap of 10% of your income not to do 5000 So this isn't quite legal yet. They keep putting this off. It was supposed to be legal last year. Now they're saying at the end of this year, but I, it's legal, it's just that the SEC and then FINRA have not written the rules and regulation. They keep kind of postponing them. And we'll see, we'll see one, uh, if it ever becomes legal, and we'll, two, because of the limitations on it, we'll see if it's cost prohibitive and it'll actually have an effect. Because in Title II, it's unlimited the amount of money that you can raise. In Title III, you're limited to $1 million per calendar year, right? So, you know, so if you're a growing business, $1 million may not be enough. Um, all right, the next one, this one just kind of passed. Uh, I think, what, June 19th it becomes that you can actually use it. This is Title IV. A lot of people, not you, some people, uh, I also believe that this will, be, this will be the game changer here. It really lowers the barrier to go public. So if you were gonna go public on the stock market today, right, it'll cost you roughly $4 million to take the company public, right? Because you have to find one a broker dealer that will work with you, then you gotta fly him out there, then you, he's gotta do his due diligence, which you pay for, then you gotta do the roadshow, which you pay for, right? So it costs about uh, 4 million bucks to take a company public. So you gotta be raising about 100 million bucks for one, the broker dealer to be interested, and two, for it to be worth it, right? But, so, Title IV kind of changes all of that. There are two different tiers all the way up to $50 million. Uh, and look, I will, I'll give you my website later and you can dig deep. Uh, Sydney certainly has a website that you can also dig deep on. And I'll send you this slide deck. There's also, those are federal laws. There are also interstate laws. So every state will have an exemption. I think there are 12, 13 maybe now. Uh, and I'm not really gonna get into that. What else? So some of the things that, is, that have happened over the years, that have kind of shifted the IPO market in the US. So it used to be in, you can see here, 1998-2001, rules on decimalization, compensation, research and trading. It's the wolves of Wall Street and the penny stocks. You know, they were ripping people off, so the government came in and they basically 
squashed all the compensation that could be made by broker dealers to help out these littler penny stocks. And what it's basically done is it's lowered the IPOs since these laws were in effect. So the gray line of the IPOs, so this was 2002 when it took, look what happened after the laws. So the companies that needed the most, the smaller ones, have really been hammered by a well-meaning law that was just really short-sighted, right? So the Jobs Act is kind of starting to rewrite this, right? Um, this is another act, another law that passed, the Sarbanes-Oxley law. Well-meaning, Enron, what was it, WorldCom, they were all taking advantage, so they passed these rules and regulations in the Sarbanes-Oxley, where some of them were well-meaning, where you know the, the CEO and executives have to sign off on that, their financial um, statements. But basically what happened, the largest uh, economy in the world, the US, is now number 11 for IPOs. Number one is Hong Kong. And it's a lot of it has to do with Sarbanes Oxley. But there are exemptions and we won't get into it, but this and it's you know it's not the only reason why uh, IPOs have shifted to really big IPOs. You know what happens is if you're looking for hundred million or more, a lot of people can help you, big markets, big money, but it's that micro cap IPO that's really suffered since two, in the mid 2000s And I think Reg A Plus and the Jobs Act are really, you know, I think we're really moving into the golden age of uh, micro cap IPOs or smaller IPOs. This combined with the, uh, the increase in the tick size in trading. So right now, whenever you buy a stock, you can trade at a minimum of a penny. It's kind of moving up to five cents, right? And, and on its way up to a dime. This will increase liquidity and market makers for smaller cap IPOs. I think we're really moving into the, the golden age. They may think different. Really fast, I'll sum up what crowdfunding is and then I'm done. This is crowdfunding, so you get ready. Here's your company. You work, and this is securities based, by the way. You work with the professionals, they create the offering memorandum, and then you list it with a crowdfunding portal. And we can dig in a little bit deeper, because I know I'm going fast. I don't even know what I'm talking about, I'm going so fast. That's not true. Maybe it's true. Next, raising capital. The company goes to the crowdfunding portal. The crowdfunding portal typically has a database of accredited investors. They kind of invest in it. You can see all the, the crowd of investors. We'll move on, and I'll, I'll send you the slide deck, you can see this. This, by the way, is done by a broker-dealer named Scott Purcell out of Vegas. So these are his slides, he's a, a really good guy. This is the last one, post-post, crowdfunding portal. You can see the bank escrow, we'll move on really fast. I think that's all I have, and uh, that is kind of what I have. And then we'll have these, uh, we'll get into um, specific case examples here in a minute. But I want to go ahead and let the panel introduce themselves and maybe give a little uh, brief uh, overview of what it is that you do and uh, then we'll kind of open up the questions and maybe and I'll, I'll have a few questions for you. You want to start Amy? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. So my name is Amy Wan. I'm general counsel of a real estate debt crowdfunding firm yes. called Patch of Land. We are based in LA about a year and a half. Oh, you want that? Okay. Am I not talking loud enough? Is that better? Okay. Uh, my name is Amy Wan. I'm general counsel of Patch of Land. We are a real estate debt crowdfunding portal. Uh, based in LA, we are about a year and a half old now. Um, just finished our Series A at $23.6 million, um, which I guess makes, up, makes us the second best funded portal now. And uh, we're a little bit different from the other portals because we're much more niche. Uh, one is we do 506C only, as uh, opposed to, for example, 506B. Um, the second is we do debt only, so we do not touch equity. And then the third part is we actually pre-fund all of our deals. So we actually close the transaction and give the money uh, to the real estate developer to ensure uh, closing on time. Uh, sorry, it's weird because there's an echo. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and publish it on the portal for the accredited investors to invest. So this is their site right here, uh, Patch of Land. I mean, um, you know, I kind of walked through it. Uh, why don't we go ahead and we'll, we'll get in. We'll actually log in and, and go through your site a little bit later, too. Go ahead, Sydney. Hi. Well, thanks for having us here, Chris and uh, George Stam, student. And, uh, uh, my name is Sydney Armani. I am the CEO of the publisher of CloudFundBeat. CloudFundBeat is the international easing. We're in seven countries. You know, which is in the U.S., uh, Canada, U.K., Germany, you know, uh, Netherlands, and uh, you know, we're actually in France too. Crowdfunding phenomenon started a couple of years ago, and uh, I studied this in the, with a couple of guys actually in Cambridge. 
and the Grand Chang Hang, and Grand is one of the head of the alternative finance in Cambridge. And that involved with the people in the Berkeley Institute, Dr. Richard Schwartz. I've been in academic world for a long time, and I appreciate mostly that the people from academic world and the crowdfunding has been observing, studying, and making a report, analytic. So we put all this public everything in the crowdfund beat. And we have two conferences that, you know, more of a smart content conferences. We have in one in Silicon Valley in third year. And uh, one is basically here in Washington. This is the second year of the National Press Club. So uh, my experience in crowdfunding, so usually we see all these companies that birth up this new company I met, Carlo, which was just started off in all this mobility mobiles and some other ones basically and prosper. And we have good friends actually like Mr. Steve Sinali that he writes for us. So we have a lot of people that they have been in this business for a long time to write for us. So um, thanks for being here and I'll hand it off to Steve Sinali.
uh, somewhat of a new rationale that the, uh, the regulators have saying, you know, we can't fight it, so we have to play with it. Um, as uh, Chris was mentioning, the, uh, the, the one unique aspect of the JOBS Act is really the Title III thing, is allowing investors uh, that are not accredited to invest in privately you know, or unregistered securities. But you know, the, my, my retort to that is that most of the, uh, most of the uh, business growth in the United States are privately held businesses. You know, entrepreneurs set up their own businesses. Well, they own securities in their own businesses, which are unregistered securities, and that's where most of the wealth is created. So there's a lot of, you know, I, uh, I tend to be somewhat of a um, polemic when it comes to, you know, all the, you know, to all the advocates. Well, a lot of this stuff is not new. It just, it's repackaged and it's being revisited. Right, for sure. I ran the FDIC Disposition Division for 2008, 9, and 10. So if there was a bank in the Southeast, I closed it. So I saw every single one of those. It was so bad. I mean, we would go into these banks and close them, and we disposed of their assets. That was with the division that I ran. But there would be a file in there for a loan of, on small balance commercial up to $10 million. We had one that would have a sheet of paper with just the first name of the borrower. I mean, it was so crazy. It was crazy at that time. But anyways. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to. We have been observing this in the past couple of years, you know, internationally and in the whole kind of a crowdfunding from, you know, reward crowdfunding, from equity crowdfunding. And uh, what is the hottest segment of this crowdfunding has become real estate. Real estate is, you know, it's nothing new. Everybody gets together, they put certain money and they buy a building. Now, and it's, it's, it's the tangibility of these particular projects you know, that will make a lot of investors to be comfortable to you know, invest in such platforms. And in just in the last you know, two weeks or maybe about a month, there was about almost uh, $50 million investment from the fintech industry in Silicon Valley has been invested in what company, like you mentioned, $23 million. So these platform, a realistic platform, they are, you know, they have different niche, they have their own products, you know, and uh, they're just hot, and uh, it's, it's here to stay. You know, a lot of companies, big companies like, you know, uh, Carl Ives, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, Carlton Group, you know, some big institutional investment, but uh, they are in real estate, they see that, you know, in the, you know, this is the way to go, basically. So it's a lot of opportunity for, you know, and unfortunately not many people know about this. You know, it's a lot of people who are just in a conference that we talk to the, you know, the people that they do big PPM, you know, mini IPOs. Not many people are familiar with this, you know, in the industry of real estate. So it's a great opportunity, you know, for people that they want to get in this segment and it's going to be the, the way of the future. It's just these platforms are basically investment platforms. You know, you can you can seek investors from all over. So, you know, there are companies that come from South Africa, from Australia. You know, it's happening around around the world. The biggest segment, the most hardest segment of this crowdfunding from reward, it's, it's real estate, and, and it's here to stay. So, it's a very very. And I'm talking in a way of we see it from the outside, and it's a great opportunity. You know, because not many people knowledgeable. So. I, I, I have to give it to you. You're, you're, you're one of the knowledgeable people that came to that crowdfunding and being in general school. So it's, 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 it's a great opportunity. Whatever you guys want to build a platform or work for the big company, they don't have the knowledgeable people. Yeah, we'll get, so um, we'll, get into, uh, uh, we'll get into the sites a little bit about the revolution of what crowdfunding is, both on the investment side, so as an investor investing in assets, um, it, I think there's more of a revolution for people to to invest uh, small amounts into larger investments. I mean, I was an analyst at a large REIT, and uh, we had all these sophisticated tools and products and services, and we were able to analyze these investments that, aren't, uh, that weren't available to the general public. Well, now crowdfunding allows as an investor that you can log in on a site like Catch and Land and use these analytical tools and do deep dive into these offerings, and then you can invest as small as, what, 5,000 bucks per offering? along with others so that you can build a diversified portfolio of, you know, cultivated, at least on your site, cultivated offerings. And um, so in marketing, there's something called short copy and long copy. Uh, short copy would be uh, just a TV commercial, a few minutes, right? Long copy would be an infomercial, right? Long copy pulls 10 to 1 versus short copy if you're advertising, right? It shows that people want, if they're interested, they want as much information as they can get um, at their fingertips right then and right there, right? 
So crowdfunding, or at least in the uh, in the investment side, right, is a long copy version. It's really the, the, the real revolution, I think, is the digitization of the offering memorandum. So if you wanted to, to build a portfolio of investments, right, uh, I, you'd have to read through a lot of these, at least on the alternative, alternative uh, investment site, right? But crowdfunding is really the digitization of this, and we'll, we'll break down a few of the crowdfunding pitch pages. But what it allows you to do is sit there. So in the U.S., there are eight million, roughly eight million accredited investors in the U.S., right? Roughly only about a million of them actually invest in alternative investments, and it's, I believe, because of lack of deal flow, right? Most of these accredited investors, net worth of over a million, a couple hundred thousand a year in income, they don't have time to read through offering memorandums to find suitable investments. But crowdfunding, the digitization of the offering memorandum allows them to consume this information, as much information as they want. They can deep dive into it, and we'll show you uh, a little bit later the, uh, the profiles that the syndicators or the wholesalers can build on these sites, right? And they can deep dive. They can deep dive into the to these offerings, and they can consume it at their own time, at their own at their own pace, on whatever mobile media that they want. So I believe it's really I think you mentioned it, it's the digitization of these offerings that is really the the revolution of it. And in crowdfunding, if you're if you're on the the, the wholesaler side, the real money is the follow-on money, right? The the internet is permanent. Everything that you do here, and if you get a reputation of as a as a trustworthy syndicator or a provider of deals. Your, your future is golden. Does that make sense? Because that, that history will follow you. And, you know, it's okay to, you know, look, nobody wants uh, to get zero returns, but it does happen where, you know, not there isn't 100% success rate on syndications, right? So if you're honest, uh, you know, bad news early and you open the communication and you become a trustworthy provider, it's the follow-on funding and crowdfunding that really leads to gold. I mean, I don't know if you've heard of this, but there are a lot of stories of, some of my friends actually in the single family dispersed space where they're doing blind pools of offerings and they'll, they've had a few successful offerings that they upload onto the site, right? And then they have a new offering. My friend raised $750,000 in 72 hours. It's because he had an established track record on a portal, right? And he had proven, some of it is, you know, he was giving a preferred rate of one was 12%. It came back at, I think it was like less than 1%. But he was open and he was honest and he didn't hide from the fact that it wasn't the returns that he wanted. But the next time he was able to raise 750,000 in 72 hours, and then following that on a bigger blind pool, he raised 1.2 million in about a week. So once you get established on a crowdfunding portal and start building a, a reputation, the, the 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 ability to fund deals is amazing. Uh, how many accredited investors do you have on your site? More than that, I think. I have no idea. I'll say 45,000. They will know. We'll say 45, yeah, so. No, maybe a couple. But all of them do. So these crowdfunding portals are repositories for databases of accredited investors, by the way, self-selected for the type of niche deal that is being offered on that portal, right? So if you can, you know, the good thing about the internet and the proliferation of the, the portals is you can search a portal that's, that has offerings that are similar to the type of offering that you want to make. You can log in, you can deep dive, you can research of the successful offerings, and you can copy it or, you know, uh, mimic it and produce your own offerings. Does that, does that make sense? Right, so we'll dig into it a little bit deeper, but uh, this is a, you know, this is a change in the law. So this isn't going anywhere. We'll see. If you know, a lot of people question the short-term uh, impact of crowdfunding. Well, Title II of the crowdfunding, which we talked about, has had a huge, multi-billion-dollar impact. Reg A plus, which just went uh, legal 60 days. You know, the short term, four or five years out, eh, maybe, maybe it won't have a big impact. But if you do it 10 years out, two decades out. It's really going to change the way capital is raised. Um, and Title III, we'll, we'll see where Title III goes. All right, so where do we want to go from here? You want to start? Let me, let me say yeah, you just mentioned Title III, and I'll hand it over there. And, 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 and I look at it from the outside. I mean, you know, it, 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 it's, there's all this thing happening, Reggae Plus, Title II, which is, you know, you can advertise, you know, to accredited investors. It's all good. You couldn't do that. It was 70 years old. Law dads, you know, you couldn't do that. It will shut you down. You'll, but there's, there's, and I want to be, you know, we want to talk good about crowdfunding, and crowdfunding is nothing new. You know, I always talk to different places, you know, from the, you know, they, the, the churches and synagogues and mosques, they, they were ahead of us. You go to the church, you know, at the end of the day, you know, the, the pastor, you know, the, the plate, that's crowdfunding. The government collecting tax is, 
crowdfunding. So it's nothing new. They figured out what we do. Now we're living in a digital age, you know, and just everything is going to that way. And we got to be careful. This is a very new industry, and uh, they, you know, they, they, you know, Chris will speak about the SEC didn't pass it, you know, Title II. And their company is very responsible, it's transparent, you know, you go, you see what you are, you got to be there, you see the projects. So it's like companies like Patch of Land, Reality Mobile, and some of the fundraisers, and they are there. But the, the question is, once this Title II is, you know, is already passed, which is Title II, a lot of non-accredited investors to come to this, and they get as low as $100, like lottery ticket, to come to this platform and be investors. There's nothing wrong with that. You can go to Las Vegas and just put ten thousand dollars, nobody stops you. But we come to the, you know, to be responsible, the fiduciary responsibility that you have. You gotta be careful about this title too. You gotta guard it because you don't wanna have some scammers show up and then you have all saving and I mean you guys probably young enough to know but we had those saving and loans every once in a while we had this and you probably read it in your book and all so we gotta guard it. We gotta not happen this you know somebody can put a platform and say, well you can get into this for a hundred dollars and that's 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 what we gotta guard it. It's it's here to stay. It's, it's like Steve mentioned, it's a digital revolution in this you know finance. You know every industry had to finance. They had some sort of kind of application except the financial industry. So still is the old timers. You know you got a comfortable. You gotta, it's it's old school. You know, real estate always been in school, you know, you, you, you learn it from father, grandfathers, you know, and we all learn that it's a good asset to have more than you keep it to stay there. So you gotta have, you know, the challenges to gotta make those people comfortable with this new way. And these guys they have done a good job, you know, go to the conferences, talk to respected yeah, yes it is, you can put a couple hundred thousand dollars investment over there, but still you gotta do the check balances. I know Patch of Land does that. We have, you know, they, they know who they are, what they are, contact them. So it's not that just in, they give loan to anybody. So that's those are the deals that have to be done. Steve. Um, so just to summarize, so I know that you know, I mean, I I stumbled on crowdfunding in 2011. So I mean, I understand Title Two, II, Title Three, and all that kind of stuff. So Title Two is the lifting of the ban on solicitation for alternative investments. Just to summarize, right? You have to be uh, the investors have to be accredited. And you have to verify as the syndicator that they are accredited, and you can self-host these. You know what I mean? Basically, all the Title II. There's a, a few more modifications, but what they've done is they've lifted the ban. So pri previously, and these laws are still, or these exemptions are still in effect. A 506 C, uh, or I'm sorry, a B, a 505, and a 50. They're still out there, but you cannot generally solicit. Title II lifts that ban so that you can start advertising. Title III is where unaccredited investors are allowed to uh, uh, invest in a, a rate or exemption, or I'm sorry, offerings that are not on a public market. Does that make sense? Uh, that, is, that is not legal. Well, it's legal. The rules just haven't been written yet. So you're not, you're not allowed to use it yet. And they, those offerings are limited to $1 million max per 12 months by the syndicator, right? And the accredited person can only invest up to $5,000 per year if they're under, what is it, $100,000 or $60,000, right? Uh, if it's under $100,000 a in year in income, you're only allowed to invest $5,000 per year, right? If you're over, you can only invest $10,000. So we'll see. Uh, that, that one isn't quite proposed, that one isn't legal yet because the rules aren't written, but you can see the limitations of only being able to raise a million dollars per year if you, if you need more than a million. There's questions on whether you can run them concurrent. What did you come up with in your meetings? Can you do a concurrent? Title um, three? Well, it, we don't know yet. It, I, you know, Title three, I can comment on it. I think when it comes to, you know, Reg A, Reg A plus, uh, 506 B, 506 C, it just depends on whether uh, the type of offering we have, whether it's, you know, private, private, or whether you can do general solicitation. Okay. So I feel like if you're doing Reg A, Reg A plus, 506 C, that's all good. But once you start mixing the private ones with the general solicitation ones, I think you're you're getting to work here. Yeah, good term. Uh, Amy's the general counsel for Patch Land, and uh, we'll dig in. So, you know, I, I always start these conferences or these uh, workshops, and we dig into the titles and everything, and half the people leave, and half the other half are asleep, right? Yeah. So, maybe we'll. Uh, so, long story short, that this is not Kickstarter. This is not Indiegogo. This is a change in the way uh, companies or syndicators are allowed to raise money, and it's a revolutionary change. The, 
you know, to give Congress or the lawmakers credit, they recognize that the way businesses uh, or the way businesses do business have fundamentally changed, and this is their first attempt to compensate for that change in the raising of money. So, you know, to pass a law in D.C., and you guys are in D.C., you probably know better than me, but it takes roughly a decade, right, of hard work, a lot of lobbyists. Well, during the downturn, once the capital markets froze up, uh, a group of people uh, from South Florida and all over the place got together and they solicited, uh, their, they, they went to the government and they passed this law in 10 months, right? So uh, it's kind of self-explanatory, the rules and regulations, how outdated they were prior to the, this attempt, if that makes sense. But, all right. So maybe we should open it up for questions. Do you have any other comments? Or qu Steve, did you want to? No, let's, uh, let's do questions. Yeah, so these guys are all West Coast, by the way, on East Coast. Uh, they're definitely Silicon Valley. And uh, I actually got an office in London, so. Oh, okay, so. We have a brand between here in London. I mean, and I come often to New York City and you know, love to be in Washington, D.C. We work with lobbyists here. Yeah, we work with, uh, like I mentioned to you, we work with a couple of the think tank you know, Enterprise Institute. You know, and uh, so they all into it. This is here, too. Let me, I'll, let me tell you fast how big this market will be. So, you know, a few billion dollars here and there has been raised since Title II, which is impressive. But with Title III and Reg 8 Plus, they believe that this will be a $300 billion market here in four, five, six years, right? So all of the VC money that is raised is roughly, what, $30 billion per year is what they invest. So this should be 10 times bigger than the VC market that is currently out there. So that's the opportunity that this, this will bring, right? Uh, in alternative investments to Reg D, right, in 2012 there was over a trillion dollars raised using Reg D exemptions outside of the public stock markets. Mostly institutions, by the way, using these alternatives. But you can see that 8 million accredited investors, only a million actually invest, right? A trillion dollars of investment in these alternatives. So potential $300 million market, but do you see the big gaps? 1 million to 8 million, right? And this opens up all of those markets to wherever they're going to go. All right, so maybe we can open it up for questions. Yes. Hello, Professor Morris. Thank you. Sydney, uh, you were talking about crowdfunding. Uh, I don't know if I heard it correctly. In Africa, Southeast and Southern Africans. Yeah, the Africa what, is. Yeah. What, what is the potential for crowdfunding on the uh, African subcontinent? Uh, well, it's nothing new in Africa. It's key art companies, and they do you know those microfinance for a long time, and nobody and they're doing a great job. You know, I mean, I've seen it through USAID, but you know, it's it's just basically is the concept of you know, uh, you know, giving them a fish, you know, show them how to fish. So, a lot of these companies is happening in South Africa, you know, and also in different places. You know, whether it would be equity, whether it be financing entrepreneurs, it's a huge potential. You know, the gentleman that is talking about, you know, it's one of them, Rudy and uh, Jason Best, that they, they did the act for the, you know, the original, uh, you know, called the sponsor of the JOB Act. They work for State Department. They are right now in Nairobi. We just had a text from them yesterday, you know. And so they work as a part of the State Department ambassadors. They go all around the country, especially all the African continent, to to create, to show them this concept of the crowdfunding to, for small businesses. And you know, so and, and the government, you know, actually endorsing it. So it's 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 just huge. It's happening around the world. It's happening in China. It's happening in South Korea. You know, and uh, it, it appears to be more in China. But it's it's got the it's got the it's going to the future in the company. So if you think about it, it's like uh, mobile phones, right? So if you were in the subcontinent of Africa and you needed to run landlines to each house, each hut in Africa, it's just not going to happen, right? But then. Mobile technology came along and it circumvented, it took over and it circumvented and it changed the lives of so many people. So if we were going to go to a third world country and we were going to try to establish capital markets, think of the task of trying to do that, right? But if we could do peer-to-peer -peer interaction and use proven techniques and systems and give them to that using the internet and mobile phones, think of what you can jump over. Kiva.org is a great example of that. They only loan peer-to-peer, -peer, by the way. They're one of the original. Like I said, 550 million. U.S. dollars are invested in Kiva.org that are uh, invested micro loans less than 500 bucks in countries all around the world. So, yeah, on the, uh, the World Bank just published, I guess, within the last three or four months, a report on crowdfunding in the develop, developing countries. Uh, there's a huge initiative you know, through you know, the, uh, the African area, through the uh, all through Asia, even in the EU, 
where capital formation is, is a really key focus because you, you're trying to boost these economies. Um, and as Chris mentioned, you know, one of the challenges in, in building new businesses is capital formation. And when you drop the sort of walls and the, the means by which capital can come in, that is using you know, technologies to facilitate transferring of money literally from all over the world into certain places, you create a more efficient construct where new opportunities can happen. And so it's really interesting, you know, the U.S. securities markets, which is the sort of the subject matter here, uh, you know, our securities laws were written in 1933 and 1934, and there's been iterations and whatnot. But the, the basic um, uh, legislation or regulation dates back, what is it, 80 years now, 90 years now. Uh, and most other capital markets throughout the world tend to emulate our structure in terms of public markets and private markets and so on. Um, it's interesting, while we as the United States has really advocated this whole crowd finance mechanism where people can come online and, and deploy capital, it was taken, you know, again, the JOBS Act was, was uh, approved in 2012 and we're still jerking around in terms of how to deploy, say, just the crowdfunding and not accredited. You've got countries like Italy, there's places in Africa, through, you know, through Asia, that from soup to nuts, from the time they wrote the legislation and they actually enacted it for, you know, for uh, production purposes, was six months. Italy, start to finish, six months. And so there's an importance and a growing notion within a lot of the, the developing countries and those that are challenged economically, like the, you know, the whole BRICS area, they're trying to do more things. Uh, they see this as one of the tools to uh, either kickstart or rejuvenate or just develop their internal, you know, their internal economies because you can access capital from all over. Uh, question to Emmy: uh, uh, Patch of land. Uh, what regulations are you working with right now? Is it five or six B, five or six C? Are you going to use uh, A plus? And what are the bottlenecks you see in that regulation? Uh, so today, Patch of Land is a 100% 506C platform. We've never used any other type of structure. Um, and, and there are good reasons uh, behind that. So for example, if I were to demo uh, our website to you right now and actually show your offering page, right? If I were a 506B platform, that would be illegal. But... Because you can't generally solicit. Right. But under 506C, you can. Now, under Reg A+, you can generally solicit. You're allowed to take money from uh, unaccredited investors um, up to a certain limit. Uh, there, so, uh, to, to get into the weeds a little bit, there's two types, right? Tier 1 and Tier 2. Tier 1 is 0 to 20 million, but for that, it's going to take a long time for you to get approved. You have to get the SEC approval and state approval, and then you have to get states to all coordinate and talk to each other and so I don't think tier one is going to be used that much. I think tier two uh, will be utilized. Um, I, you know, people debate this a lot and I've, I've literally had a call from so many securities attorneys like once a week, hey do you want me to help you file a ready plus? Um, that might be good for your uh, operating though funds for the actual operations of the site, right? I don't see you could fund real estate with it. Well, the thing is, with a real estate deal, because you can't do a fund structure under a ready plus, right? Um, and if you, so, so uh, sorry, fund structure aside, um, if you if you have a a really good pe a really good uh, maybe commercial or whatever kind of real estate deal, even though under tier two, um, you can. Uh, you know, increase your pool investors. I think realistically, whereas under 506C, it's instantaneous. I click Edgar, uh, I file online, and there's no approval process. With Ready Plus, you still have to get the SEC to approve. It could take, what, 90, 180 days, just depending on how much work, <laughs> how much work you need, right? Um, I have heard murmurings that some people are trying to are going to try and see if they could use it for an SVP structure. Uh, 
So to do, you know, maybe 50 million for this SPV, 50 million for that SPV. SPV is special purpose vehicle. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and uh, most of the trainees I've talked to, though, have said that they don't think uh, that that's going to be viable, but we'll see what the SEC says. And then the other big thing is there are uh, real estate portals that are talking about using Red A Plus to in, in, in a serial type offering. So it's kind of like off the shelf. Once I have this, you know, you file a blanket thing um, ahead of time, and then you just take offerings off the shelf. It's one continuous offering. I think that's much more viable. Um, and the murmurings for that is that it it is actually possible. The downside to that is if you can't use it with an SPV structure, then you're stuck at one offering at 50 million, and once you max out, that's it for eternity, right? And so you need you need to be able to find a sustainable solution to Reddit Plus. So we yeah. Well, so the only thing that's legal right now under the Jobs Act is Title II. So that's what all of the look well. So that's what the under federal exemption. Fundrise is a unique example, by the way. They're based here locally, and they've kind of trained the regulators, I think, in Maryland and a few of the other <coughs> bordering states, to do these reggae, interstate reggae plus offerings. Uh, but Title II is, would be the majority of what the crowdfunding portals are using uh, these exemptions. And they're writing a memorandum on each, uh, uh, an offering memorandum on each uh, offering on their portal. So the portal is a repository for separate offerings, and then the investors can log in and view the different offering and choose which one they want to invest in. At a minimum of 5000 they don't have to take out the whole thing, if that makes sense. Yeah, you were certainly interested, I wanted to mention, about that uh, in the meantime that the SEC's passed some of these titles, and there are a lot of states that take the matters to their hand, and it's sort the intrastate crowdfunding. So you'll be able to, you know, Started in Georgia, and now we have all the country, you know, states that started from Texas, you know, maybe there's a bunch of them. I don't know, there's, there's more coming in every day, you know, from Wisconsin. So, but you can only offer your issues within the states. So, you gotta be, you know, that. So, there are crowdfunding happening into that's what they call the definition of intra state crowdfunding. It's behind it. Yeah, you gotta yeah, be yeah. 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 just, just, it's just coming every day, they're adding up, they're adding up. And but the, the, the fact is that you can offer within the state. You gotta have all limited, you know, to anybody who's coming to your website, you know, to your platform within the state. They're 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 advanced coming. You know the, you know there are also states that are fighting the, the federal exemptions as well. One of the unique things about Reg A Plus is that you're allowed to test the offering without filing it prior. Does that make sense? Where if I was going to take the company public, I would have to. I would have to register it, spend all the money, and see if there's any demand for it. So Reg A Plus allows you to test the demand prior to filing, which is uh, interesting. But th that's not legal till June 19th either. So we, you know, we'll. I mean, in the short term, we'll see. You know, the problem is, is that I don't think the SEC is ready for it. So you have to put this package together and then give it to them and wait for them to get give it back to you. And I don't yeah. think they're ready for it. I know they're not. We'll ready. see. They say they're building out technology. Yeah, building out technology. <laughs> So, um, all right, any other questions, comments, complaints? Yes, concerns, suggestions? Could you comment on, I mean, it, it's my general impression of this is it seems so much easier to raise capital or their debt or equity. Uh, but, you know, I know it's, it's a pain to personally do that and you know, try to find right, well, find investors and the right ones. Uh, but what would you say are some of the, the risks where some of these people might never get to meet you in person and are talking on the phone? Right. Yeah, so what are the, the risks of not? Uh, well, so you don't you don't do that now on public markets, right? I, you know, look, I own Facebook, but I never met Zuck, Mark Zuckerberg. He, Zuckerberg. He won't return my call. But I'm trying. I'm gonna keep on trying. So um, you know, the the rate. You know, here's the thing. He said. Uh, so the good thing about the internet is that it's permanent, right? And in Title Three, this is where unaccredited investors can invest in uh, exempt offerings. Um, there's an entire section, a lengthy section on the comments that are uh, underneath these offerings where they have to remain there, they, just how you handle the comments, they can't be deleted, and, you know. So it's kind of like the Encyclopedia Britannica and Wikipedia model. So it used to be that when Wikipedia came out, Encyclopedia Britannica hired all these people to do third party tests to say, to show that, you know, Encyclopedia Britannica is much more, um, 
uh, is much better than Wikipedia because professionals are hired to write it, right? Well, that just doesn't hold true anymore because you have all these non-paid, you know, super enthusiastic editors that are constantly updating. So it's the wisdom of the crowds are much better than than the um, than um, just a, a few professionals that are hired to do it. So. What we'll see in crowdfunding, and what we're seeing in crowdfunding, is that the bad actors are identified very early and often by the wisdom of the crowd. We see it a lot in Kickstarter, where you know there is there are incidents of uh, fraud in Kickstarter, but they're usually caught relatively soon, and then the bad actors are identified, right? And then in crowdfunding, like a securities-based crowdfunding, you know, to be registered on a portal, you can't just go sign up. You have to be vetted. So it's back. What do you, how do you vet your? Uh, oh, Background yeah. check, experience check, credit check. Yeah. So you'd really have to do some fraud, fraud or some serious planning to commit fraud on Title II. So on Title II, the one where accredited investors, they lifted the ban on solicitation, you don't have to go through a portal right now, right? You could self-host that offering, right? Get a securities attorney and a broker dealer. I mean, don't, don't do this on your own because if you screw up an exemption, you know, best case, you got to give the money back. Worst case, you go to jail. But and by insurance, yeah. So Title III, where accredited investors, are unaccredited investors can invest, you're going to have to go through a, a, a portal. It's called a funding portal, and it's a new category of broker-dealers. And so they're the same kind of due diligence that's required to take a company public and protect the investors is going to be, or a version of it, a slim down version, is going to be required to take these going forward. So I would say that you're never going to be 100% uh, rid of fraud, there's always going to be fraudsters there, but I would say that it's at the same level, a lengthy explanation of saying that I think it's at the same level as public markets today. But I guess yeah. it's actually like the opposite, the what? perspective that I'm looking at, I'm, I'm looking at as a potential syndicator, like looking for, trying to avoid bad investors, you know, like where if you find someone who's, who has money but doesn't know what they're doing, you know, you yeah. don't have the opportunity to interview them over the phone and say, how much are you looking to invest, and all of a sudden, yeah, you got a terrible investor. No, no, no. No, no, no. no you get a bad investor. You get a bad investor. You know, it's kind of like the eBay buyer, the yeah. Amazon buyer. The guy who's constantly condemning you in comments. You're a liar. You know, and it's a, They're I'm sorry, I put the right stamp. No, like, when you think of like, stuff like Amazon. You know, well, it, it, it is actually a very legitimate concern. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I, I just talked to a potential uh, investor and doing the real estate crowdfunding. <laughs> yeah, I want to hear about that. So I, I, was, uh, uh, I, I talked to a potential investor, he's a real estate developer, he wanted to invest. But then he met at the conference with, not, with another 200 developers, and he asked that specific question, would you go to on a real estate crowdfunding to raise funds? And they said, no way. A, a lot of them, at least according to his words. And uh, he said, why? Well, we don't want all those unknown investors into our deals. So there is a there is a concern and there is a fear from real estate developers side. Well, so there's, there's actually two about problems. those investors who will uh, create uh, trouble down the road because they don't know right now what they're doing. Right. Yeah. There, I just need to make a point. Um, there's really two philosophies um, on fundraising. There's two different types of sponsors, and it's created business opportunities on both sides. The you know, one sponsor wants to maintain that relationship with the investor on an ongoing basis. He wants to you know, engage in whether it's conversations online, offline, he wants to have a sense of what the investor's appetite is, uh, wants to be in touch with them on an ongoing basis for ongoing reporting, because if in fact you nurture that investor, they'll come back for another deal and another deal. So you know, consumer marketing. Uh, then there's another camp of sponsors who uh, who don't want to deal with the investors whatsoever. Just raise me my money. I don't want to deal with the investor. I don't want to talk to them. And they outsource the entire investment process and the investor relations process so that you know, the sponsor doesn't have to deal with any of that. They don't have to follow up. So some of these platforms or service providers come in, they handle the investor relations, they handle the reporting. And so, so there's, there's two. And then there's you know, hybrid examples. But um, it depends on the sponsor. You know, I, you know, this, this whole crowd uh, space is, is, is not just about capital formation. It's you know, how you can do your business a little differently outside of real estate. You know, certainly you've brought up you know, the Kickstarters and then the Indiegogos, and then you have 
those like sort of love those consumer product companies and you've got other yeah. you've got other types of crowd space. But it's really interesting and I think it's a it's gonna be a big trend, is that major companies like Universal Studios, Nike, Procter and Gamble, General Mills, they all have crowdfunding initiatives, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And it's not because they need to raise a million dollars or two million dollars, but what it enables them to do is have a direct dialogue with their end consumer. If you think of these big manufacturers like the Procter & Gamble's, they create a product, they sell it into the wholesale channel, the wholesale channel sells it into the resale to retail channel, retailers then sell it to the end consumer. But Procter & Gamble as a manufacturer really doesn't have a you know, sort of higher level more of this type of consumer research because it's so far removed. Well, you know, now with the power of the crowd, and, and I think you, you mentioned it, is that it allows the you know proper and Nike's another example. Nike did a, what's called co-creation. Um, it basically worked with the consumer to develop a shoe from scratch with the consumer. You know, they could spend tons and tons of money on product development, but what they wanted to do is forge a closer bond with the end consumer and develop it together. What happened is if you have some uh, you know, bragging rights by saying I contributed to this product and thus, yeah, I'm gonna buy it at the end of the day. So it changes the relationship between between the parties. And, and it's not only to assist in, you know, in gathering that information uh, from what the consumer wants, and then of course establish a, a, uh, you know, a consumptive outlet for the, the company, but what, what they find is that it actually reduces product development costs. Because you, you know, a lot of companies, when they manufacture a product that goes through, you know, distribution channels, sometimes they overdevelop it, they over-engineer it, um, they add features that really aren't necessary or in demand and may elongate their project management, product development period, may increase their cost. And so by having a better understanding of who your end consumer is, it actually creates cost, cost benefits to the manufacturer. And so we're seeing the same thing in sort of real estate, is that real estate crowdfunding in my view, is nothing but online syndication. The syndication of real estate has been around for thousands of, or you know, hundreds of years. All crowdfunding is is the use of technology to enable that communication between someone who's looking to raise capital and those that are the providers of capital. And so, as I said in the opening comments, it's really just using technology to facilitate that on a more efficient basis. May I comment on that? Yeah, the, the whole phenomenon also with crowdfunding is there's another word for it, it's crowd collaboration. You know, the companies like Uber, Airbnb, you know, you go there, the biggest transportation company in the world does not own one car, that's Uber. You know, and also the biggest hospitality industry, you know, you go to this Airbnb, but you go to every one of them, they get that crowd collaboration, whatever you know, that place is nice, that the taxis, I mean, the, the drivers get, the same thing, you know, in this crowdfunding, you know, I know Amy's, you know, they have the back room discussions, you know, and then they have, you know, what is the deal is and other ones. And uh, also, you know, like as Steve mentioned, his brand royalty with some of our like Parker and Gamble and a lot of other ones, you know, they don't need money or Sony for that matter, you know, they are doing crowdfunding, but not because they're looking for the money to initiate the products, because they want to get that feedback so they don't go build something to bring it to the shell and there's nothing happening. So it's very important and also it's happening to every kind of part of it, you know, movie, you know, you see the great rise of money. And I've seen you actually in a couple of conferences, I think it was in New York and IMN, so I remember I know you're going to this real estate company. And what I find out in these these big real estate companies and big, you know, they, they, they don't understand it yet. I mean some of they have their fear. And, and I talked to some of those people that you're referring to. They said, well, we have a good deal, why well, we have to bring it to the public? We, we do those back. That's the essence of that, we want to eliminate that, because it's technology. That's what I was mentioning to that in the beginning, that it's still the old school. We have to make them comfortable, that this is the way to do it. You know, you know, you have to, it's, it's not, it is even better for them, because they somehow, they go work in a bigger project. That's what Reality Mobile and Patch of Lab did, or Fundrise. They fundraise within the World Trade Center right now, one of the you know, established World Trade Center. So we're going to give it equal you know, access to every investor. So we eliminate that 
you know, big old bull club. I would have to be careful to say girls, girls club for that matters. You know, and so that's what the essence of the cloud collaboration brand work.